40. Principles of Reckoning. The purpose of this section, entitled The Green Letters, was to set forth the truths of identification, as well as some of the basic principles by which God brings us into their reality. As a sequel to the letters, this study deals with the essential principles having to do with our reckoning, reckoning on the identification truths. It's an attempt to answer the questions, how do I reckon? To facilitate our understanding of the subject, we will define at the outset the three basic elements of the reckoning that counts. First, we look at principles. According to Webster, a principle is the law of nature or the method by which a thing operates. The how of reckoning is based on principles. Our father works according to his spiritual principles to fulfil his purpose in our lives. For example, he brings us into the reality of our identification on the basis of the principle of knowledge, that is, know the scriptural truths. The principle of faith, that is, reckon on the truths that you know. And the principle of time, that is, yield to his lifelong processing for growth in the truths that are known and reckoned on. So we look at identification with Christ. The truths of identification are those facts in the Word of God that reveal our identification with Christ in his death to sin and our subsequent recreation in his resurrection. As for known believers, our Father judicially placed us in his Son on the cross so that we died in him to sin and are now are alive in him to God. So we look at reckon. The word to regard as being or to count as true is what the word reckon means. Romans 6, 11 calls us to count upon the truths of our identification with Christ. Consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. We count on the truth that is made known to us. We exercise faith by resting on that fact. It may be helpful to observe that there is a pattern throughout our spiritual development, whether we realise it or not. We began to reckon at the very beginning of our Christian life. As lost sinners, we were convicted of our need and shown in the word of God that the Saviour died on the cross to redeem us. By his grace, we reckoned on the truth and we received him as our own personal Saviour. With hearts full of love and zeal, we became active for the Lord as the new life began to emerge. All went well for a time, possibly for several years. Then, imperceptibly, a deadly declension set in. We had been so busy enjoying the new experience and activities that we inadvertently began to neglect the source of the true life and service, both the written and the living word of God. Well, the inevitable result was the reassertion of the enslaving influence of sin, self, law and the world. Almost before we realised it, we were defeated, heartsick, and wretched. 
Finally, after years of failure in both life and service, we were prepared to see something of the wonderful truths concerning our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. We saw that he not only freed us from the guilt and penalty of sin, but also from the power and domination of the principle of sin. Here we see the pattern of the experience of babes in Christ. We believed, we struggled, we failed. Now, what of the pattern of our adulthood when we come to the place of reckoning on the identification truths? Just as in our counting on the justification truths for the initial steps of birth and babyhood, so in our reckoning on the identification truths for growth. We start immediately to work for the Lord in testifying of our new experience. We want everyone to know of our new joy and freedom through reckoning. Not only do we seek out opportunities to share and to teach these new to us truths, but when necessary, we make openings. We are surprised to discover that few, if any, fellow believers prove to be receptive. As a matter of fact, many become quite antagonistic and some even accuse us of falling into error. There are times when we limp home not quite as sure or enthusiastic about it as we were when we started. Then too, we begin to grow careless about our reckoning we forget about the liberating truths for longer and longer periods of time. Once again, we are relying more on our experience than we are on the source, that is, on the risen Christ, and the means, that is, reckoning, of receiving his abundant life. And what is the sure result of concentrating on experience rather than truth? Well, the answer is defeat. Thus, the pattern is completed. Our failure in the identification realm parallels our failure in the earlier justification phase. At just this point, many believers begin to waver in their hope and expectation of freedom from the old life and abundant growth in the new. Their confidence in the truths of identification begin to wane. How many defeated Christians have bitterly exclaimed, I tried Romans 6, but reckoning didn't work for me. Most discouraged people turn back to the futile struggles of Roman chapter 7 as a result of this seeming failure. Some even follow the alluring experience-centred errors of the so-called holiness groups. But whatever it may be, all outside the realm of the spirit-taught and spirit-ministered identification truths results in compounded failure and bondage. Galatians 3 verse 3 says this, Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect or mature in the flesh? Patterns spring from principles. There is a definite and essential principle underlying this pattern of seeing the truth, reckoning on it, experiencing the good of it for a time, and then failure. Therefore take heart, fellow believer, for our Father is ever working according to his principles and his patterns and purposes for us. When the Holy Spirit brings us to a new and higher plateau of truth in the process of our growth, we see, we reckon on, we appropriate that which we understand. But the important thing to remember is that this is only the beginning of a new spiritual plane. At the outset of our reckoning on the identification truths, 
all is exciting and wonderful. And we are given a taste of the reality of these facts that we are counting on. However, tasting is not eating. This initial experience is but a token of all that lies ahead in the long, slow, growing process. Our early enthusiasm makes it all seem clear and simple, but there are infinite depths and heights in every realm of truth into which he intends to bring us and to establish us. This will require both time and eternity. Hence, the Holy Spirit allows us to fall after our eager beginning. He applies the principle of need in every phase of our advance. The calculated failure is used to cause us to move beyond the early infant enthusiasm to the place where we have to dig in and settle down on the explicit truth of the Word of God. Before we can grow in any aspect of truth, we must be established in the knowledge of that truth. In every area of our spiritual development, it is one thing to begin on a new plateau, but it is quite another thing through faith and patience to inherit the promises. Hebrews 6 verse 12. Our immaturity was understandable during the milk of the gospel stage of our Christian life. But now it is time to face up to adulthood. We have partaken of the meat of identification. And we read in Hebrews 5.14 that strong meat belongeth to them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In our need and desperation, we grasp a truth, but our initial knowledge is insufficient to enable us to persevere in it, to cause the truth to take hold of us and become a living part of our life. The Holy Spirit removes the token experience from us but the knowledge of the truth is retained. By this means we are to be established in the truth, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 The first taste of identification awakens our heart hunger for its practical fulfilment. Philippians 3 verse 12 says this, I follow after, if that I might apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. It will help us to bear in mind that the principle of time underlies all of God's dealings with us. Growth takes time. The God of all grace, who hath called us unto his everlasting glory in Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a little while, make you perfect, mature, establish, strengthen and settle you. 1 Peter 5 verse 10 41. Three Steps in Reckoning Everything that has to do with our Christian life, including the longed-for freedom for the power of sin and self, is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our spiritual birth in him, we know him in his person to be the very source of our life. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, Christ who is our life. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. Now, failure in reckoning is certainly not failure of the truths reckoned upon. Oh, never! Without the scriptures, we would have absolutely nothing. 
Our authoritative Bible is the only means in the universe by which we can ever know anything rightly and personally of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But sad to say, even with the revealed word, there is little enough of this all-important spiritual knowledge among believers today. We should remind ourselves that the written word was designed specifically by God to bring us to know the living word, the Lord Jesus. Never for a moment is the written revelation to be bypassed or slighted in any way. We are to study, meditate and count on it through the ministry of the spirit of truth in order that we may know the Lord Jesus. He is our all by means of the word. His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4. In Colossians 1 17 we read, By him all things consist, and he is the head of the body. And in Colossians 2 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Surely it can be affirmed that the written truth, authored and administered by the Holy Spirit, is the vehicle by which the Father and the Son come to us, and we to them. Still, as to reckoning on the specific identification truths centred in Romans chapter 6, nearly all of us stop at the written word. It is as though we stand there with a death grip on a handful of truth, repeating the conviction, oh, I believe this is true, and I reckon, reckon, I reckon. Much of the failure of our reckoning is due to erroneous expectation. We are delivered by belief only in the liberation truths. Certainly we must believe and appropriate these truths, but the actual liberation comes as a result of our intimate, our personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Simply put, the principle is this. Liberation is the liberator. The reckoning that counts is made up of three essential steps. But most believers stop at the first. Many stop at the second but none can know the true results of reckoning apart from reliance on all three factors. Our freedom from domination by the sinful Adamic life was completely positionally through our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. There we shared his death to sin and from there we entered into his life to God. From this eternal position in Christ, our experiential freedom and growth are carried out as we first know and then reckon on the identification truths. Secondly, abide and rest in our liberator. And third, depend on and walk in the Spirit. Not just the first step, not even the first and second step together, but all three steps comprise of the walk of reckoning. The first step is to know and reckon. When we first realise our identification with the Lord Jesus, in Romans 6, 1 to 10, we begin to count on these wonderful truths as we are encouraged to do so in verse 11. Often there is a definite crisis 
in the life at this time, as some emancipation from bondage is experienced. But it isn't long before most reckoners go into spiritual shock. They do not understand that this initial taste of liberation is but a strengthening vision, a brief time of knowing of what lies ahead. Our Lord removes fluctuating experience so that eternal truths, clear and steady, may be our basis. We are not to rely on experiences for growth, for maturity, no matter how wonderful or how stimulating they seem to be. As we learn more of the truth on which we are reckoning, our knowledge becomes a set heart attitude. I have died to sin. I am alive in Christ to God. Romans 6 verse 11. Although our initial reckoning may bring blessing, its primary purpose is to foster the twofold process of growth. Always delivered unto death, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, in our body. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 11. The second step is to abide and to rest. Each of us must become aware of our union of life in the risen Lord. We are a branch in the true vine. By means of this awareness, we learn to abide. We simply rest where we have been newly created in Christ. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. John 15 verses 4 and 5. Not only is the written word to be counted on, but the living word is to be rested in. The third step is to depend and to walk. The liberating principle is fully embraced by including the final step. That is walking in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Deep within our spirit, he abides forever. And there, through our study, he teaches us the truth of our position. Then, as we reckon on the truth taught, he applies the crucifixion of the cross to the old man and ministers the life of Christ to the new. In Galatians 5.16, we read this. Walk in the Spirit, or depend upon the Spirit, and you shall not fulfil the lust of the flesh. And in Romans 8, 2, we read this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Our reckoning becomes effective as we count on the word. Abide in the Lord and walk in the spirit. Another subtle reason why our reckoning flounders in the midst of these three steps is that our motives are centred in self. We know and count on identification for our liberation. We abide and we rest in him for our growth and our peace. And we seek to depend on and walk in the spirit for our empowering and fruitfulness. Is it any wonder we have to be child trained 
and led into a Christ-centred activity. The Father's purpose in justifying us in Christ and identifying us with him is that we might be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8, 29. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 4, 11. The following example from the experience of Jacob illustrates God's method of centering our hearts upon himself. In this instance, he accomplished the spiritual by means of the physical. The wily, self-centred Jacob had taken the correct steps and he was in the land. But Jacob still had to be turned from Jacob to God, from self to the Lord. He needed to be rendered helpless in himself in order to become wholly dependent upon God. It is through this same principle of strength out of weakness that we are developed in the not I but Christ life. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 7 and 9. 42. Knowledge of Reckoning Knowledge of scriptural truth should precede spiritual growth. For example, in the early chapters of Paul's epistles, doctrinal truth is presented, while in the latter chapters, they deal with the practical results of the truth set forth in the earlier chapters. We must first know what the triune God has done before we can count on him to do. We read in Ephesians 1.17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. There is a crippling tendency among believers today to depreciate head knowledge of the truth and even doctrine itself. Emphasis is being put on so-called heart knowledge which is gained by means of experience. This, however, is to place condition before position which is the opposite of God's scriptural pattern. Truth reckoned on fosters the only healthy and abiding spiritual experience. For faith to function, there must be spirit-given knowledge of the word. The spirit of truth ministers truth to us by means of our mind. The spiritual mind that relies on him. This head knowledge gives us the facts on which we exercise faith or reckon. In time, through deeper understanding and a quiet assimilation of the truth, there is both head knowledge and heart knowledge. We not only believe, but now we know experientially. Paul had believed on the Lord Jesus for many years before he wrote the words in Philippians 3 verse 10, which say that I may know him. And likewise, he urges us to meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. 1 Timothy 4, 15. And in Proverbs 23, 7, we read the following. For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Some people belittle head knowledge because they see many Christians who seem to know so much scripture and, and yet whose lives fail to adorn the doctrine, Titus 2.10. Doubtless there is some justification for this reaction, but it should be realised that one's knowledge of truth is always in advance of his growth in that same truth. 
Many believers know truth in which it will take them a lifetime, even eternity, to grow. Further, there are those on hand who know about truth, having grasped and, and even memorised scripture by means of the natural mind. Such knowledge will never become living experience, though. In the final analysis, we are not to decide about spiritual matters by observation of other believers. It is the Holy Spirit who must teach us by means of the Word, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Paul states that there are those who have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. In Romans 10 verse 2, ideally head knowledge precedes heart knowledge. However, neither one is preeminent above the other. Both are essential for healthy growth and effective ministry. Heart knowledge alone cannot progress beyond the fluctuating feelings and emotions of babyhood. It can exhort, emotionalise and share experiences and blessings, but it cannot lead others to establishment in the truth. To share effectively, we must be brought to maturity by both head and heart knowledge. We are to reckon and to stand on certain truths for our foundation. And linked with these are other truths on which we are to reckon and rest for growth. So first we're going to look at foundation and then growth. Foundation. There can be no growth unto maturity without an established foundation. By knowledge of the word we are anchored and rooted in the eternal foundation of our Christian life. First, we are born anew in Christ. In 1 Peter 1.23 we read the following. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. Second, we are accepted in Christ. Our Father is able to accept us fully in his Son. In Ephesians 1 verse 6 we read the following. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Third, we are eternally secured in Christ. In Colossians 3 verse 3 we read, Your life is hid with Christ in God. And fourth, we are positioned in Christ. We read in Ephesians 2 verse 4 that God hath quickened us, or God hath enlifted us together with Christ and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is futile to seek to grow by means of these truths, because they are foundational truths. But it is imperative that we grow on this imperishable foundation. And so we now look at growth. Once we receive the head knowledge and heart knowledge by which we are established on our foundation in Christ, the question of growth in him is all but settled. The deeper truth, the spiritual master key to all growth and maturity, is the fact that we are not only founded in him, but we are complete in him. For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10. As the Holy Spirit gives us the knowledge of our position in Christ, we are prepared to know him as our life. Colossians 3 verse 4. To reckon himself alive unto God in Christ... The branch must know the true vine as his complete source of life. 1 Corinthians 1.30 we read the following. 
of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. To reckon on the truth is to rest in the truth and to receive the fruit of the truth. Can we now see where the failure began in our Christian walk? We had the knowledge of the justification truths for our new birth, and on this milk of the gospel we sought to grow and serve. But there was defeat, because the foundation truths are for the beginning only. Further knowledge was our need, we had simply gone beyond our teaching. We knew our Lord Jesus as the foundation, but not as our life. The same problem exists in many of our early attempts to reckon on the identification truths. We seek to reckon ourselves dead to sin without being established in the knowledge of the cross. The failure is further compounded by our seeking to reckon ourselves alive to God in Christ without first being established in the knowledge of him as our risen life. We must be established in the knowledge of our foundation and source if we are to become established in our reckoning and growth. And so finally we're going to look at something called the three pillars of knowledge. There are three pillars of knowledge having to do with position on which the Christian life is to be secured and matured. This is the first pillar. The knowledge of our birth, acceptance and security in the Lord Jesus. That's the first pillar. The second pillar. The knowledge of his cross as our cross is the central pillar. The cross of Calvary is not only the central fact of the universe, but it is also the central fact of the life of the believer. As we see our identification with Christ in his death to sin, we know his cross to be our cross. We know self to have been crucified there. We know ourselves to have been cut off from Adam and freed from the power of sin. Only from this pillar of knowledge can we reckon ourselves dead to sin in our daily walk. And finally the third pillar. The knowledge that we are alive and complete in our risen Lord places us securely on this third pillar. Now our reckoning can be fully established as we count ourselves to be alive to God in Christ. Now his life can be manifested in us by the growing fruit of the Spirit. This is the practical fulfilment of the very purpose of God for us, that we be conformed to the image of his Son. 43. Spirit Applied Reckoning The Helper, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. Ye shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. John 14, verse 26, and chapter 16, verse 4. The Helper, the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus chose the perfect designation in introducing the Holy Spirit as our helper or comforter. Even in our sin, he comforts us. True, he convicts us of sin. And Holy Spirit conviction can be intense. But he does so in order to point us to the blood that ever cleanses us from all sin and to the Lord Jesus, who is the propitiation for our sins, the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. We read about this in 1 John 1, 7, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, and Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25. The enemy condemns us when we sin and seeks to crush us under the weight of guilt. But the comforter doesn't condemn. He convicts so that we might confess and be cleansed from all unrighteousness. 
1 John 1 9. When it comes to reckoning, we need the Holy Spirit as our comforter more than ever. We are quite surprised when we begin to realise how much suffering is involved in reckoning. We cannot reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin without experiencing the deep inner crucifixion of the cross as it is applied to the self-life. The dual truth on which the Spirit has us reckoned is that which he makes experiential in our lives. First, we count on having died to sin and are always delivered unto sin as the outworking of that position of death. Secondly, we count on being alive to God in Christ. And the Spirit causes the life also of Jesus to be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11. All spiritual growth entails a lifelong process. We have an infinite Lord as our life, to whose image we are being conformed by the eternal spirit. Our dire need causes us to long for and expect immediate emancipation and newness of life as a result of our reckoning. To a degree, the Spirit complies with this expectation during our early encounter with identification, but he must bring us into the process of growth. Consider the pattern of the Mount of Transfiguration experience. Although Peter, James and John were given the glorious privilege of beholding the Lord Jesus transfigured, each one had to come down from the Mount, the Lord Jesus and Peter going to crosses. James to the sword, and John to exile in lonely Patmos. The same principle applies to us. We're given a glimpse of the glory and the reality of truth reckoned on. And then we are taken into God's processing so that the truth may be as real in us as it is to us. Through his purposeful dealing with us, our objective reckoning on the truth becomes subjective experience in our lives. As we count on our old man having been crucified at Calvary and our having died to sin on the cross, we become progressively cross-centred Christians. As we count on our new life in the Lord Jesus, we develop into Christ-centred Christians. The path of the cross is the path of growth. In our failures we learn more of what self is and thereby come to hate the natural Adamic life. Then it is that we are taught to glory in the cross by which we are freed from the old life's influence as well as the grip and the lure of the world. In Galatians 6.14 we read the following. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Reckoning is the only means of escaping the entanglements of this world. It takes the separation of the cross, and our abiding in Christ. As the Holy Spirit applies the cross within, he takes us through difficulties and chastenings. We must face up to the fact that the cross has only suffering and death as its ministry. And when we realise that always delivered unto death means the daily crucifixion of self, we begin to glory in the resultant freedom. Hebrews 12, 11 says this. Now no chastening, that is child training, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. If we are going to receive the benefit of the cross, we must go through the suffering of the cross. That is where we come to know and appreciate the Holy Spirit as our comforter. He comforts us in our very crucifixion that he applies. 
and we learn to glory in the cross that crucifies. The work of the cross causes us to rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 verse 3. He will teach you all things. It is often the case that hungry believers, needy as they know themselves to be, are more eager for the experience than for the revelation. They want a minimum of truth and study with a maximum of results. But the more experience-centred those believers become, the less truth established they will be. The penalty of this wrong emphasis is self-centredness instead of Christ-centredness. This sad and selfish condition develops when we endeavour to handle and control the truth that we see. But the truth of the word does not respond to self. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. As we study, we are to rest in the spirit of life in Christ. The Lord Jesus said, The spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. John 16, verse 13. There are those who even go as far as to attempt to use the Spirit. They want the Holy Spirit to give them power and many other self-centred experiences and blessings. The Holy Spirit does not respond to such unholy aspirations, though. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you. In all the vital work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, his intention and purpose is to glorify the Son in the individual members. The Lord Jesus prayed to his Father and said, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. John 17 verses 9 and 10. How is he glorified in redeemed sinners? Our new birth means that each one of us is a new creation in Christ, at which time the Comforter enters our spirit to abide forever. John 14 verse 16. Spirit to spirit joined, the Holy Spirit to our spirit, and we are partakers of the divine nature. At birth we are babes in Christ, but as we grow in him, we develop the likeness of life, thus glorifying the Son. The Holy Spirit receives the life of Christ and brings him into our regenerated spirit. For that life to develop within, he reveals to us the Lord Jesus in the Word of God, thus feeding on him in the Scriptures, under the illumination of the Holy Spirit of Truth, the new life in Christ grows and is made manifest in our mortal body. We grow in him as we allow the Holy Spirit to show him to us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In the midst of finding out about ourselves, we are to be especially aware of what we are in our Lord Jesus Christ. While the Spirit must cause us suffering in the crucifixion of the self-life, he comforts us in our growth in the new life. In James 5, verses 10 and 11, this is what we read. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have suffered in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. As we turn from the old man by reckoning on the work of the cross, 
We turn to the new man in Christ by reckoning on the work of the Spirit. Gradually as we grow, there are less and less works of the flesh evident, and more and more of the fruit of the Spirit manifested in our daily walk. Galatians 5, 19 and 22. What comfort there is in the faithful work of the Comforter. In the natural realm, a worm is changed into a butterfly, a different creature, but of the same order of life. In the spiritual realm, a believer is reborn, a totally new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, we yield ourselves into God as those that are alive from the dead, and in dependence on the Comforter, we walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 13 and chapter 6, verse 4.